even though my family was not affected by the internment, we were still affected by the war. And that's so my Uncle Suey, um, who I showcased, and maybe we'll play that clip, because my Uncle Suey is one of these characters that I could have made a film about, right? He's an 86-year-old Japanese-Canadian man, um, second generation, um, who remembers, he has a photographic memory to when he was pretty much three or four years old. So he remembers everything clearly to that age. And we did four to five hours of interviews with him to, to pull these stories out, and he didn't stop talking the whole time. And I let him go and go and go and go and go. So for me, making this documentary as well was also a collection of my family history and, my, and the stories. Um, because for an 86-year-old man, he is sharp, sharp as, sharp as a pack. And, uh, and the, the great thing was is that I was able to include quite a bit of him in the documentary, about seven minutes. But I would love to have just made a doc about him in general because he could recall these stories to the T. And, and one thing that I kind of was very interested about, and this came up in the doc, and this isn't talked about very much at all, and nobody will talk about it, is that the sort of conflict between the Japanese Canadians from the coast and the conflict with the Japanese Canadians from the Okanagan. And the, the usage of the term coastal Japanese just to distinguish themselves from the local Japanese. And the coastal Japanese that came to the Okanagan during the war as migrant workers for the farms, and how they were treated, and how the local Japanese really tried to distinguish themselves from the coastal Japanese because they had built such a community there in the Okanagan that they didn't want that reputation to be tarnished. And there were some very interesting stories that came out of that um, that nobody would talk to me on camera about. Um, and I was sort of I had a discussion just earlier about that. And, and there's almost, you know, it's almost one of those things that maybe it should just be left alone um, because the war was hard enough that to look at sort of how, you know, um, a group like, you know, Japanese Canadians could have this sort of clash between themselves during a very tumultuous time in history is probably something that maybe shouldn't get brought up and maybe something that shouldn't be explored, right? Because that's kind of the documentary subject in itself is how could one group kind of be at war with each other at the same time as, you know, there's all this sort of, um, you know, racism and hatred happening towards them in general anyway. And uh, that was something that I kind of sort of had asked Uncle Sui about. And I know that he had a lot of stories about that, and he knew a lot about that, but he, that was the only one thing he did not want to talk about. Um, because that was a very, very painful experience for the Japanese community in the Okanagan at the time. Um, because, you know, they didn't want to have that, that sort of distinction. But it did happen, right? Um, because as you saw in the, in the, well, maybe we'll show that with that clip too, the signs that were posted, you know, coastal Japanese, keep out, you're not wanted. And those were hanging in quite a few areas in, in Kelowna. And everyone seems to have a different recollection of those signs. But some, pardon? Um, of the Kelowna JCs. And the JCs are kind of like a, um, a commerce group. And they were kind of associated with the, um, the local sort of uh, council and uh, mayor. And so it, wasn't the, it, it was not the local Japanese Canadians that posted the sign. No, it had nothing to do with that. No, no, no. It was the actual um, politicians and uh, a lot of the community groups that didn't want the coastal Japanese to infiltrate the Okanagan. Um, so they did their best to try and keep them out of Kelowna. Um, but that also caused a lot of tension towards local Japanese because obviously people thought they were the coastal Japanese and there was a lot of hatred and racism towards that. So that was a story that I didn't know a lot about and that's something I wanted to explore in One Big Hapa Family a little bit because a lot is talked about with the internment, but what happened to the, the, the few Japanese Canadians that weren't interned? And I think that to me was kind of an interesting angle to look at because, you know, um, I, didn't, I never heard the internment stories growing up. I didn't even know what the internment until I was probably about 18 or 19. I didn't read Obazan in high school. It was never taught. Um, so I didn't know much about it at all. And, and I took grade 12 history and it was, it was never even scratched um, upon. So for me, it was really late in my life when I actually learned about that. And so that's why I think with this, when I did the animation and I'm trying to get the kids into it, right? I want to, you know, one being that he had to change his name to Sue, right? Um, from Sui Mori, which to me isn't a hard name to pronounce. Um, but back then, um, you know, for the teacher it was, right? And, you know, changing your name to Sue at that age is going to be hard enough for a kid. Um, and then kind of moving on to sort of how the, the, the British kind of government at that time or the influence of 
how that sort of affected the, you know, the poem. He remembered that poem vividly. And when he read that, like he even, that was just out of his head. Like he, he, he could recite that poem like that. And I was like, sitting there dumbfounded going, well, how did you remember that after you know, 80 years? Right, because he looked at it, it was probably grade two. And, but he remembers that vividly in his mind, and he can still recite that entire poem. Um, you have eaten Nostra Dei and turned the turtles off their legs. You know, and it, it, to me, it's the most racist thing I've ever heard in my entire life. Um, and then the more blatant racism words, what's that Jap, you know, get that Jap out of my house kind of thing. And, and that was a, uh, actually, he, he told me it was a prominent sort of um, man in Kelowna, a businessman, who, who chased him off um, with his friend. So, kind of looking at that, um, it was kind of a, a, a strange time, obviously, you know, growing up in Kelowna during that period. Um, but it kind of led into something more of, you know, now there's another two, two characters that people have told me that I could have pretty much made a whole doc about as well, and that's my auntie Emmy and my uncle Cyril. And for Kelowna, that was the very first intermarriage of its kind in Kelowna, and then we're talking 1971. Right, so you know the first intermarriage between um, you know a, a man of African descent or Trinidad and Tobago and a Japanese lady. Now that happened after their, my their, their, my auntie Emmy's parents had passed, um, and so I was always kind of curious. Well, what would they have thought of that marriage? Because it was hard enough back then for you know someone to marry someone Caucasian, um, let alone someone who had African descent. In, in that sort of vein of, of, it was so Western, it was so kind of, they, they were not taught the language, da, 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 right? That I guess as we mix and we blend, there is this idea that we need to fractionize ourselves, you know. Do you think your mother and your sister, do you think it had to do with them not having to be evacuated? That they didn't have that sense of being Japanese? Well, I think, yeah, because they're that age that it is born in the 60s, right? So it would have been after the, or 50s, you know, like 50s, uh, mid 50s. So, yeah, I guess, um, you know, especially being in Kelowna, right, it's a tight-knit community in itself, whereas most pockets of Japanese Canadians, you know, we don't have a Japan town, right? And that's part of the reason why, you know, there was this lost culture and heritage. Um, you know, you look at Chinese Canadians, and they've got Chinatowns all, all across Canada, and they, they have centers like Richmond, right, and Vancouver. So when I look at that, and I think, you know, even growing up, I didn't think of my mom as being Japanese Canadian, and we only ate sushi on New Year's, right? There wasn't a lot going on in the household that that sort of warranted. And my dad um, hated fish, and he didn't like seaweed, and he hated all that stuff, right? He was a bean potatoes kind of guy. So the only time we ever ate that stuff was when he was uh, golfing on Wednesday nights, and Wednesday nights. <laughs> um, so because of that. Um, you know, I, I really cherish Japanese food because I never got it very often as a kid. And although, you know, you have these experiences like with the sushi, taking it to Multicultural Day and then feeling really, really, really bad because nobody wanted to try it. You know, it was disgusting. It was gross. Seaweed? Yuck, right? And it wasn't even raw. It was like uh, Fujima or the big rolls, right? Um, so with my mother and her sisters, you know, just being in, in this community of, like I said, um, my Uncle Stewie is his son. The thing with this film I didn't do, and what most documentaries will do, is they put title cards of who is who, like who is this, who is that. I didn't do that. I didn't want to do that. Because partially because I wanted my family to feel comfortable talking in this documentary. I didn't want to like say, oh, this is um, David Koga, or this is so-and-so. But David, he was um, in the documentary as well, but it was David Koga is my Uncle Stewie's son. And he was the most articulate, I think, out of all the people I talked to because he, he really knew that. And when he said, um, we didn't associate, we wouldn't want to date other Japanese because we thought we were related, right? Mm -hmm. And that was part of kind of, that, that's a big thing. And that's something I've heard from a lot of, of, of people, um, Japanese Canadians and that, uh, that generation, is that, yeah, they, they were such small pockets of Japanese Canadians that they figured that we must relate to so-and-so because, you know, there's only a few of us. And, but even my Auntie Janet, who says, oh, I never thought of you as being Oriental, right? her, her boss saying that. And uh, so I guess you kind of think that, yeah, like, you start to think, I was starting to think a lot about that, too, is outer appearance, right? You know, it's, you look Japanese, the kids are a little, you know, you can see a little bit in their face, and as they go down the line, you know, to the one child who's a quarter Japanese, and she's blonde hair, blue eyes. Right, so how many generations does it go down before it just completely you lose that look, right? 
Um, but also the idea that blending is kind of where we're headed, right? And to create a true Canadian identity, maybe that's where we need to go, right? So what I'm really hoping is that other sort of cultural groups like the Chinese Canadians and South Asians may learn something and realize that, you know, it's okay to mix, it's all right, you know, it's, it's, it's not going to be a bad thing, you know, if, if, if we sort of, like I said, you know, Audrey Kobayashi says, you know, we're growing, we're not shrinking, we're growing, right? We're growing because we're bringing more people into the community, right? And I think that's something, you know, and I know a lot of elders are kind of worried that Japanese Canadian culture and heritage will fade away, it will disappear, because the kids are becoming more mixed and not looking Japanese, or, but, but what I found is internally they're feeling Japanese, they are Japanese, and what's gonna happen is, is it's gonna shift, right? It's not gonna be the same thing as what it was 10 years ago, it's not gonna be the same thing as it's gonna be 20 years from now. And, you know, I think, like everything evolves, right? So we will still always have a Japanese Canadian community, um, but it's gonna be different. And I think embracing that change is important in order to let these children in the community, and they're gonna wanna do things a little differently, right? And they're going to do things differently because they are mixed, they are blended, and you know they may have ties to, you know, their other half as well, right? Um, you know, essentially, I thought of myself always in Japanese, half Japanese, because that's what made me different, right? And I think for a lot of children, um, you know, they find that connection to self through that difference, right? So yeah, it's something that, of course, you know, in 85 minutes, I try to tell as much as I can, um, which is almost to me almost too long, right? But at the same time, it's, 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 I think it's something that had to be brought up, right? Um, because it was so personal and so close to me. So yeah, I appreciate that. Yes? Um, in your film, you were saying um, you did school in Japan, and you were talking about how you felt there. So I was just wondering if sometimes you feel like you're not part of the white world, not part of the Japanese world, but do you feel more, you feel accepted because you feel you're selfish. Canadian, not saying you're half yeah. Japanese, like, you know, saying I'm half well, Japanese. Yeah, exactly right. So, you know, Japanese Canadian, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the hyphenation of, of what we are and who we are. You know, I think that was an experience for me because I think at that point I had just made a film about my sort of self identity called What Are You Anyways? And I was looking at, okay, well, well, what are the experiences I went through being mixed? And then I went to Japan to show people the film there. And I think I went with this intention that I was gonna find this great spiritual like awakening and, and I, I will discover my roots, right? And the complete opposite happened, right? I, I realized, wow, I don't speak the language. People don't look at me as being of Japanese descent or even Japanese. And, you know, I just felt really alienated and kind of weird. I, and I told some people today that the only spiritual experience I had that I was gonna include the doc that I took out was that I was in this bamboo forest in Tokyo, and I was with this delegation from Kelowna, we went with the mayor and stuff, and it was with their sister city, Kathy guy, and I kind of split off the tour group, I was like, I've had enough of this tour, so I kind of walked into this little bamboo forest, and in Tokyo they had little parks everywhere, right, and this bamboo forest grows everywhere, and so I just stood there by myself alone, and you could just hear the rustling of the wind through the bamboo, and I don't know what it was, but I felt this complete sense of calm and and the spirituality just kind of entered my body and, and I kind of sat there for about an hour and didn't move, right? And I think, so deep down, I think there was maybe a part of me that connected, right? Um, but it was on a different level, right? It wasn't, because it is very Western, it's very different. Um, it's not the, the, the Japan that was 50 years ago, right, before the war, or 60 years ago before the war. So um, I want to go back, but I think this time I'm going to go back on my own sort of terms, right? I'm going to go back and I'm going to go explore on my own and, and really sort of find a you know backpack or something, right? As, a, as opposed to sort of this cultural delegation, right? So, um, but yeah, it, it was a very strange experience, but it's an experience that sort of taught me that I need to go back and try it again on a different level, a different way. Um, because again, we are Canadian, right? And and my mother's Canadian and my grandfather's Canadian, right? My grandfather went back to Japan for a few years, but he he's, he was born here, right? So I'm fourth generation. And if you think about it, that's a lot, you know, more Canadian than some other, you know, people that you wouldn't even know um, had immigrated here, right? So it's uh, one of those things.